Yeah. You ever wonder why we're here? Well, it's one of life's great mysteries, isn't it? Are we the product of some kind of cosmic coincidence, or is there really a god, you know, with planet and stuff? I don't know, man, but it keeps me up at night. What? I meant, why are we in this room? Oh. So, hey guys, Maniac here. We're joined by DiscReader117, and we're going to be talking about what we think are some of the biggest years of Halo. Now, every, every time there's a major Halo release, it, you know, it kind of can define the years. And what we're going to be counting down is, is like, what some of the best years for Halo were. And we're going to count down all the years of Halo. We're going to talk about, and at the very end, what made them, what made each year so good. And we're going to wrap it up with what we think our best years are, our favorite years. And I know you and I disagree about this, so this is going to be really good. So what we're going to start off with is probably going to be the biggest year, you know, the big elephant in the room, the first major year of Halo, and that, of course, is 2001, and what came out in 2001, the original Halo. And, of course, that was also the year of the Xbox launch, the original Xbox launch. What can you say about that? Well, pretty much, yeah, like it, was, it was a perfect timing for both of them to come out. The Xbox wasn't doing great at first, so Combat Evolved brought it right up. Made counseling gaming what it is today. I mean, Halo was the reason to get an Xbox at launch. And it was a good reason to get an Xbox at launch. Halo, up into, you know, for three or four years at least, cut into the console's life cycle, was top ten in sales. Always. Never dropped off the list until Halo 2 come, came out. But for, for literally three or four years, Halo was always part of the console's top ten. Yeah. Which, for a launch title, is a big big deal. You'd never see that anymore. Yeah. You, you haven't seen it since. No. So it was a big thing. I think these sports maybe, if you, if you discount these sports, it probably wouldn't be. But but this was a big thing. This was this was huge. And I, plus, it was like one of the first games that really revolutionized what you could do with a game, what you could do with a console game. Yeah. And it converted a lot of players that would traditionally either be for PC or for a different earlier console or something like that, like a 2D console, into this whole new genre of gaming. It redefined everything. I mean, here you had the first time you had like a free landscape where you could get in a vehicle, yeah. you could get out of a vehicle, you could be running around, you could be investigating, you could kind of just continue on. You could be listening to the, to the epic music, you could listen to, you could pick up any weapon, you know, you could pick up your enemy's weapons, you could use your own weapons. It had a new, whole new type of gameplay with regenerative health system, which you really hadn't yeah. been used before. Not to mention that for the first time, or one of the first times at least, you can have your friend just join up and you can play against each other. Yeah, and split screen. And for, for you know, that hadn't really been seen either. I mean, split screen was kind of a staple of, of multiplayer of multiplayer gaming for the consoles. But also, they, they just took it one step further by basically creating the definitive LAN party game in their competitive multiplayer. And you could, obviously, you could still play against each other with split screen, but it allowed you to bring in four extra consoles, you know, and that really hadn't been seen before. We had course been using it for PC, but on the days of the PC, it was one user, one system. Yeah. Here you could do four users per system for 16 players. Yeah. Not to, Also not to mention that if you wanted to do a LAN party, take up your entire computer, all the cables and stuff would go with this one. Else. It was a lot easier to just bring a small monitor or bring yeah. a television. Uh, one small box and two cords. Yeah, exactly. And a few controllers and, and you basically bring that Five to your buddy's house. Ready to go. And it still worked on dedicated systems, so if you had a TV in college or something and it was plugged into the network and your Xbox was plugged into the network, you wouldn't need to move anything. You mm -hmm. could just go you know, from room to room in your dorm and you'd be able to play against anybody else in your dorm. It would work just fine. That was just how wide thinking Microsoft was. And to be perfectly honest, that surprised Bungie a lot. Bungie didn't think it would be that popular, but sure enough, it was. They just had a really good multiplayer game. So, that's 2001. So what are we going to talk about next? I mean, what we're going to, I wanted to mention, uh, first off, we are going to be talking about years where releases, you know, where releases happen. We're not going to talk about years where there's been announcements or anything like that. There has to be a definitive release. So, the next major release year for Halo was 2004. And, of course, you had... Halo 2. Halo 2 and the Halo 2 Limited Collection Edition release. This was probably one of the biggest years of gaming, period, in 2004. Not only did you have Halo 2's release at that time, but 
You also had all the major consoles and all the major platforms, PC, GameCube, PS2, and Xbox, all released their major contenders for Game of the Year. Uh, of course, there was this for the Xbox. For PS2, it was, I think, Metal Gear Solid Snake Eater. For the GameCube, it was Metroid Prime 2. And, of course, for the PC, it was Half-Life 2. Yeah. So, this was a huge year. And Halo, I think, was probably a big contender for that one. In fact, I think it was probably the biggest, the biggest contender. Yeah. Not to mention, for the first time, you were, we were starting to get collector's editions and metal cases. Yeah, I mean, look at this thing. This thing, I mean, for people who got the limited collector's edition of this, I mean, this is probably considered like one of the earliest collector's editions we could find. It's also probably one of the best collector's editions that's ever been made. It still holds up even today. If you can find one of these, if you don't have one, man, look, go looking for them because these things were fantastic and worth any, every penny of what it cost. It was only $60. That's unheard of for a collector's edition nowadays. But I mean, that, what really made this so great was they defined, you had, the, you had the steel casing, but you had the bonus DVD disc included. And that was the major thing about it. This bonus disc, the bonus disc that was included with this release, was probably one of the best making of documentaries. Heck, it was probably one of the best documentaries made of all time. I've seen other, you know, other making of documentaries included with games and stuff like that. And they were nowhere near as good. They weren't good, at, in some cases, they weren't good at all. I mean... This was a really in-depth, well-made, you know, documentary, and and I, I really got to hand it to the guys at Film Oasis who made it because they made it. They did a great job. Um, that's what made it so good. Not to mention with Halo 2, finally we're starting to see multiplayer starting to expand a lot more. Now you can Xbox play it Live. between, yeah, Xbox Live and stuff, and it's expanding a lot more. There's more maps to play and more game modes to play with. Yeah, I mean, 2002 can be considered the year of Xbox Live because that was the year the the system launched. But I think 2004 was the year where Xbox Live basically became ubiquitous to any Xbox owner's no. po po pocketbook. That's what I think a lot of people... It's finally time to, that, to use it. Exactly, because of the release of Halo 2. So not only was that probably, you know, that was like the big year for Xbox Live. And trust me on this, I've had an Xbox Live account since the days of Halo 2. And I've, I've been renewing every year. It cost me a fortune. But you know what? Bill Gates, you owe my pocketbook because of that. And you have Halo 2 to thank for it. So that's 2004. Yes. What's we'll that next year? 2007. And I think we all know why it's going to be 2007. Probably the big elephant in this room. Literally, <laughs> the release of Halo 3. Now, uh, the thing about Halo 3 that everybody can tell is that you know you had Halo 3's launch, which was extremely well taken, you know, thought out was extremely desired. I mean, everybody was really looking forward to this since they announced it in 2006. But the thing about Halo 3 was, was that yet again, they redefined the collection edition. Yeah. For once, you can't hold something. You can just hold in one hand. Mm -hmm. You now have to have two hands that carry this huge case right here. I mean, by the time Halo 2 was done, the thing about Halo 2 was, was like, after Halo 2 came out, everybody was doing this. Everybody had this. The collection edition had to have a bonus disc in a steel case. It pretty much became ubiquitous. You had to see, Doom did it when they did the Xbox version, when the, when the, when the Xbox 360 launched Perfect Dark Zero did that. It was basically, this would be, had become the closed edition. Then, Halo, Halo 3 came, comes out and they said, you know what, we'll do a two disc set. And by that point they had moved from these to tens basically. Like games like uh, Unreal Tournament 3 and stuff and Gears of War had all used tens, but it was still basically the same basic thing. They just exchanged the steel book for a ten. Halo was like, we'll do a tin, we'll do a two to set, but you know what? We'll also do this bad boy. $135. And you know what? Bungie, I blame you for the high prices of all these extra special features and stuff like that. You know, because this was kind of ridiculous. Uh, 135 but at launch. I think a lot of people still thought it was worth it to get that size statue of oh, absolutely. Master Chief's helmet. I mean, that Master Chief's helmet is one thing, but I think what really basically made this system worth the price, and I would say Master Chief's helmet alone, not, not justifying it, what did justify the whole thing, even if you didn't have Master Chief's helmet, was the third disc. Mm was the exclusive third disc for the Legendary Edition. The, the bonus disc that they included for Halo 2 was alright, was a pretty good disc, but the documentaries and the content that they included on the Legendary Edition disc for Halo 3 justified the extra, the extra price. I mean, I would have paid an extra $100 for that easily, That just that third DVD disc. What was on it? The commentary for Halo 1 and Halo, Halo 2 by Jason Jones, Marty O'Donnell, and Joseph Staten. That alone justified the price. 
On top of that, there was the exclusive documentaries about Cortana, you know, the girl who played Cortana, Jen Taylor traveling the world and stuff like that. They were huge releases. Halo, and I mean, we haven't even talked about the game. Yeah. I mean, not only before we even get yeah, to the game, too, yeah. for the first time, or one of the first times, we actually saw a console version based off of the game. There was the Halo 3 version of the Xbox 360. Right, there was that too. That, that was a big release as well. Because Xbox hadn't really done, there hadn't really, there had been Xbox releases and stuff like that that were modeled after Halo, but basically it kind of became ubiquitous that whenever Microsoft would do a game release or do a Halo release, to be perfectly honest, they would do a, a select custom console for it. It happened with the first Halo, just before Halo 2 came out. They saw fit to include a, a, Halo collect, a Halo Collector's Edition original Xbox, which was light green and very cool looking. And I yeah. really regret not getting one because if I had, if I had gotten it earlier, I should, I should have just waited and, and got and I should have gotten my Xbox sooner. Um, and there was also, of course, you're right, the Halo the Halo 3 Xbox, which I think was the first. If I remember correctly, I think that was the first Elite Xbox 360 console. Yeah, I think, I think so too. Because I think that when they launched, I think that was at a hundred and a hundred and twenty gigabyte hard drive, and I think those hadn't been sold yet at that point. I might be wrong about that. No, I think you're correct. And I also think that those were the first Xboxes to have the HDMI output. Again, I could be wrong on that one too, but I'm fairly certain that those were the first Elite consoles. They later changed them to just simply calling them the Elite, but and no longer Halo branded them. But I'm fairly certain that those were. The Halo branded consoles, or something like that, were did have a bigger hard drive, or did have a the the HDMI output, which hadn't really been seen in, in Halo consoles yet, mm. which I thought was really cool. So Halo Three, of course, was the huge major release for 2007 because everyone wanted to finish the fight. Once again, it was we hadn't seen this in three years. Yeah. There hadn't been, you know, there was going to be a major a major New York launch, which there was. There there was there was huge huge press behind it leading up to it. There was the huge um, uh, media push, the, the yeah. advertising push involving the Halo Believe uh, campaign, which I think is probably one of the best ad campaigns that ever existed. Remember when they had all the old guys talking about yep. the, um, the, the going through the museums yep. and stuff like that? And then they also had the eight minute clip of the fighting between the UNSC and the Covenant, we're trying just to track where Master Chief was going to land. The landfill, I'm sorry, the, the landfall, not landfill, yeah. landfall, the landfall uh, uh, short, which was done by the District 9 team. The District 9 team was originally going to be making a Halo movie, that was originally what they were supposed to do. They just didn't because they, uh, it, it had nothing to do with uh, Microsoft, it had nothing to do with them. It had everything to do with the, the studios didn't want it. The studios wouldn't give them the respect they requested to have right to do the property right. And they basically said, screw it, we just won't do it. You won't give us the respect to do it you know, that we're asking for. You won't treat our property with respect, we just won't do it. And they made District 9 instead, and they made the short. And um, that was a good short, too. I really yeah. liked that. That was really the, kind of one of the first times we ever saw live action Halo. And we're going to see it again. I mean... Not to mention one of the first times we actually saw live action trailers too. Yeah. I mean, we hadn't really... I mean, we had seen kind of, you know, live action commercials and stuff like that, but they weren't nothing really... Nothing to this extent. Yeah, nothing to this 30 extent. 30 second, 60 second commercials compared to an 8 minute video. Mm. We really hadn't seen that before. So, 2007 was the year of Halo 3 and it was one hell of a grand year. So... What we're going to talk about now, we're going to be talking about 2009, which was a huge year, just in releases for Halo. I mean, what came out in 2009? What, well, let's talk about what came out first. Halo Wars and the Halo Wars Limited Collector's Edition for the Xbox 360. The first time that a Halo game was released that was not a first-person shooter starring the Master Chief. This was a separate campaign, not made by Bungie, a separate team on RTS of all things on a console. This was a huge gamble, and you know what? It was a good game. I enjoyed it quite a bit, and I think it's probably a staple no, of RTS it players. Definitely didn't get as popular as the main Halo games, but it definitely got a lot more popularity than they expected to when they first released it. Right. I mean, uh, it's still actually a very well-selling game. I mean, and I know that a lot of people that are looking at RTS games for consoles still consider that to be one of the best RTS games on the consoles. Um, obviously, on the P you know, you came from a PC. You know the ensemble games. You used to play Age of Empires yeah. and stuff like that. What did you think of it? Um, well, it definitely reminded me a lot of when I used to play Age of Empires and Age of Mythology, before a console version was obviously set down a bit to fit everything onto the console. But you know what? For a console for a game, console I thought did, they, they worked the controls console, really did, well. For a console, it did great. It, I mean, if it was on PC, obviously it would be a lot better because they could go as far as they wanted to. But it was a great console game, and I was glad I picked it up. I yeah. still play it to this day. Yeah. And, um... Uh, 
But that wasn't all that 2009 had to offer for Halo fans. Of course, there was also Bungie's release for 2009. Halo 3 ODST. Probably my favorite Halo game of all time. You know, actually, what do you call it? Uh, the the Penny Arcade guys agree that this was probably their favorite single-player campaign. I honestly think, and this is just me, this is probably a contender for my favorite soundtrack in a Halo game. It's definitely got a great soundtrack. Uh, I, I have the CD of this. I, I love the CD of this. From people that have heard the only complaint that they had about this game, it was too short. That was, yeah, that was a huge, that was a huge concern about it, but you know what? I thought that every minute was good. I never it thought was it was too short because when I played it, I basically played it the way I felt it deserved to be played, which was I was looking out for every single um, node or whatever you want to yeah. call it, uh, spot. I was looking for every secret spot where they were hiding the Sadie story complex mm -hmm. because of uh, the, the city was just open world. It was like the, kind of the first time we'd seen yeah. an open world Halo game and it allowed you to explore this environment. I love spending hours just exploring New yeah. Boss at night while that beautiful saxophone music was playing with those sound effects yeah. at night and everything. And and just looking and looking and looking, spending like late nights just looking for yeah. another terminal or looking for another thing so I can hear more of Sadie's story. It's one of the first times you run up on Covenant. You won't run into 20 guys, you run into two, three guys, take out a couple of them and just do that every once in a while. It made it nice is like, you don't have to really try super hard to get through everything. Not that you don't want to or anything, but... Yeah. It was also the first game that finally allowed recon to be possible because even though uh, Halo 3 had been patched for recon, it was basically required that you had to complete some achievements in Halo 3 ODST as well in order to get recon. You could get, I think you, you, couldn't, you couldn't get, there were certain achievements in the skulls. Like they had some skulls for multiplayer maps, which were not, the multiplayer maps were not released until Halo 3 ODST came yeah. out. They later did get released, but that was after the fact. And, um, and so you needed to get those multiplayer maps in order to get those skulls to get one of the achievements, I believe it was the Brain Pan achievement. So you needed that just to get a Halo yeah. 3 achievement. But also you need to get three unique Halo 3 ODST achievements in order to get the recon. And I did. I did it. But that was much later. I honestly loved this game. I yeah, loved Halo 3 ODST. It brought Firefight for us, which was definitely a great game because yeah, it's like yeah. just waves upon waves of enemies while you have a limited amount of weapons to do it with. I, yeah. For the first 10 minutes of the thing, you'll be fighting with UNC weapons. After that, you have to use Covenant because you ran out. <laughs> well, they would respawn after. after and then they'd be like, time. hold it to the match ends, hold it to the match ends. Match over, round we'd, over. We'd spend, what, about three hours per firefight to get the achievements for it. Right. I'll talk, I'll talk, I'll mention that later. And what happened was also, I think, probably one of the biggest releases of that year, which followed the release of ODST, which was the release of Halo Waypoint in 2009. Yes, which, of course, obviously we don't have here because it's a downloadable uh, uh, channel for the Xbox 360, which was kind of like, which was very new at the time. Nowadays, the Xbox 360 offers a lot of apps, but this was the first major app, and it was yeah. entirely focused on Halo, which is to kind of show that Microsoft was finally taking Halo to show... Yes, we are the Halo yeah. console. It was also the first time we were introduced to 343 Industries. Exactly, which they had worked on that. And on top of that, they had offered, and because Bungie was talking about this a lot, this of course came after ODST, so you know, we'll, we'll keep that for, 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 you know, we'll talk about this later. But what they did was they included unlockables for Halo ODST. Yeah. So that if you got certain achievements in Halo 3 ODST and you signed on to the waypoint once it became available, you got Avatar awards and stuff yeah. like that. And that to me was a big reason to get it. Nowadays, like, you know, that's not as big a focus on it anymore. Nowadays it's used for tracking stats and stuff yeah. like that. But at the time it was about its own stats. And I remembered you and I going through all those firefight yeah. levels after after Waypoint came out because I'd be trying to get every single achievement yeah. in Halo 3 ODST and I'd need you to help me because you couldn't play Firefight all by yourself. You'd need at least a second, i want at least a second person. And we together would spend two hours, those were some fun times yeah. because we also did a second thing which was that was the year of course of the big heart thing, the bungee yes. heart because of the uh, the, the Haiti earthquakes yeah. and everything else. And, and we became a part of that too. You want to remember that? Yeah, I remember that. That was on. Um, I was actually when we were doing our second firefight on a uh, courtyard. I believe it was. Yeah. We were doing that, and uh, we all had we had our um, what's it? Our, the heart emblems. Yeah, the heart emblems. Bungie had a thing where they were going to donate a lot of money to the Red Cross for the Haiti relief. They were selling T-shirts on their website. Of course, you've probably seen me wearing those T-shirts occasionally. Uh, but uh, what we did was together while we were doing it just happened to coincide with our firefight matches that they were doing this so I we, we had to put a specific heart emblem yep. on our ODST characters and play and it counted also they allowed it in Halo 3 matchmaking 
So if we were, but we didn't play matchmaking. We were playing firefight, but that it still counted. Yeah. It's like if you played firefight or if you played matchmaking, as long as you had the emblem either on your Spartan or your this T character, it would be it would be permitted. And mm -hmm. we had a lot of fun with that. That was a lot. That I thought was a lot of fun, and it was for a very good cause. So 2009. Wait, big year for Halo, probably one of the biggest years for Halo is yet. I mean, you had not just not one release, but three major releases. So that was a big year. Okay, so what comes next after that? 2010, which was another big release. Now, I know everyone's going to basically start off by saying, well, Halo Reach came out, but we, hold on a second. There was actually a release that came out first before the release of Halo Reach, and that was, of course, Halo Legends on DVD and Blu-ray. This was a huge release because this was the first time that they had really branched out into, into the, a film medium for a video game. I mean, video game animes have been done by this point, but they had not really been done on this scale before. It had not been this big a release. I mean, they chose to do a high definition release for this one. And on top of that, they included some really good documentaries on it too. They not just teased the future of what the platform was going to be. But also the future of the history of, of the, the Halo franchise in general. I mean, what do you think of it? Um, it was very different. Showed a lot of uh, into the past Halo, a lot of stuff that we didn't know about the forerunners and stuff, leading up to the where we are now, which is Halo, right after Halo Three. Mm -hmm. And it had some great documentaries. I mean, it, there. I mean, say what you will about the episodes themselves. Even if you liked them or didn't like them, that's one thing. But there are two really good documentaries that were included. One about the history of the making of, of Halo, this the technical history, and one about um, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the the timeline, the Halo timeline. I mean, and that was narrated by Frank O'Connor. That that timeline documentary. Sometimes it's like that. Just that was just great. I love that documentary. Heck, both documentaries were fantastic. I'll cite back and rewatch that documentary whenever I, you know, whenever I'm feeling nostalgic or something like that because they were really well made. Well, let's talk about the episodes. What was your favorite? Prototype. It's my favorite too. I mean, I remember a lot of reviewers at the time slammed it. They didn't like it very much. They kind of called it like a generic, um, what do you call it? Like a generic mech battle uh, thing. They were idiots. The critics there were blind. Obviously, they haven't seen or played Halo. Yeah, before. I mean, when you're watching that episode, even if you hadn't seen Halo before, that was a story. That was a very personal story. Yeah. That wasn't just some mech battle. The mech battle, yeah, it was a mech battle, but it was a means to an end. This was an emotional story about the person in the mech and what they had to do to basically make up for their own sins. I thought it was fantastic. And on top of that, we got to see the Spartans in a whole new way. Because we got to see their 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 predecessors, yeah. what basically made the chief who he was. That we wouldn't have the chief if it wasn't for that armor. Yeah. I mean, and it, I don't know. It just seemed to me like it was probably just a great way at, at playing up like all the military, but also like all all the military factions in it. It's like, oh, here's this guy. He's charged to basically prevent weapons and, and technology that they created to fall in the hands of the enemy. It's fantastic, great, wonderful. But he's like, no, I'm not going to destroy it. I'm gonna use it, and I'm gonna get. I'm gonna save my whole squad. Yeah. And that's the ending. I mean, the ending was just great. I thought it's like, I uh, when you hear the admiral saying at the very end, that soldier I previously you know recommended for military court martial, I rescind that part of my story. That soldier is officially missing in action. Mm. He wasn't a Spartan, but he had a Spartan's honor missing in action. I thought that was great. I thought that really tied it up together. Yeah. So that was my favorite. Of course, Origins, everyone's going to want us to talk about. So let's just talk about it right now. Origins was as much about the past of Halo as it was about tidbits to the future. What did you think of Origins? Um, it was pretty because, I mean, we never really learned anything about the foreigners or anything. They built these giant rings and made the destroy the universe. Yeah. Pretty much. I mean, now we finally got a backstory to them, where they started from, what they did in their life. And how how they built the rings and what they were really used for. Yeah, I mean that was really important that we finally had a way to humanize the forerunners, so we really didn't know anything about or see anything about. And I honestly think that there was probably tidbits for the future of the Halo series, because the thing about it was was that um, for the future of the Halo series, we didn't know what had happened to Master Chief after t Halo Three. We just had no idea. That was back in two thousand seven. Yeah. There had been Halo releases up to the, after that point, but nothing involving what happened to the Chief and Cortana after the end of Halo 3. This teased that, and I think that they intentionally did that because even though Halo 4 hadn't been announced yet up to that point, 
they knew, it's obvious that they know what they were going oh, yeah. for or how they were going to open up Halo 4. So, you know, they teased in, okay, yeah, you know, Chief's still in stasis. Cortana's going a little crazy at this point. She turned a little, she was flashing a little red at the very end, showing she was going rampant. Great way to do it. And of course, yeah, there's a great way to do it. And it does a lot of other history, like the history behind the, the, the term of the Arbiter. Uh, the babysitter was pretty cool to watch. Yeah. Um, they were just great. You know, some were just like great popcorn to, to watch. Yeah. The other ones had some real heart to it. And yeah, the whole thing was entertaining. I, I, I loved it. So that's, that's Halo Legends for you. But of course, everyone's going to want us to talk about this. <laughs> This is the Halo. This is the Halo Reach right here. This is the Halo Reach Legendary Edition, and that in your hand is the Halo Reach Limited Collector's Edition. Huge, huge, huge release for for Halo that year was Halo Reach. It was probably it was Bungie's last Halo game. Actually, at that point, we thought it was the last Halo game in general. Mm -hmm. As Bungie was done, they're like, "We're done after this." It's like yeah. we're not going to be making any you more know, Halo games. And we really didn't know the three four industries at that point, other than. They made Halo Waypoint, and they helped make ODST and Reach. Right. That's all we knew about them. Yeah, so we didn't really know anything about this, so we were like, this is going to be Bungie's last game. This is like their big send-off. And they went out totally big. They gave us all the capabilities for multiplayer, a fully expanded multiplayer client, which allowed us to purchase you know, all this extra stuff. We had Finally, we had integration of all the Spartan achievement armor and stuff like that, or the, the, the award armor, or whatever you want to call it, so you can have Spartan helmets and stuff for your avatar. They had the um, a great story. You know, they, they, they basically yeah. ended it the way that Halo opened. It was like a full circle for yeah. them. I mean, it was probably one it was a really good game. It was really it was a story told really well. It was basically and I wrote about this, our generation's dirty dozen. I I will stand by that. I really think it was our generation's dirty dozen. Because the Dirty Dozen was basically like my parents' generation, kind of war movie kind of thing, which had never really been seen before. They had never made a war movie like the Dirty Dozen before yeah. they made the Dirty Dozen. And as a testament to its director, nowadays we have war movies like that all the time. Of course, you got Inglorious Bastards and stuff like yeah. that. But our generation really didn't have that until Halo Reach came out. That was, to yeah. me, a great... Like, you, to me, actually, Halo Reach kind of reminded me of the movie Saving Forever Ryan. Because really? you follow this one team throughout all their missions and stuff, as they lose men throughout their mission and stuff, just to go and save this one spot, one person, you know, mm -hmm. type of thing. It's like, it just, you can feel for them the whole way through. Yeah, and here they are trying to save Halsey and trying yeah. to save, and at the very end, it's basically like they're the people that are responsible for saving the Earth yeah. because they're the ones who got Cortana to the Master Chief. That was their big thing, and they, you know, they, they, they held the planet off long enough that they were able to, you know, protect, you know, to protect Cortana from Chief, that, and, get her, and get her to Chief. And without Chief getting Cortana, there would be no Halo story, no. basically. So I thought it was great. I loved, I loved Halsey's scenes in there, too. I thought it had yeah. some great scenes. George's death, of course, was fantastic. Uh, Kath's death was tragic. Yeah. Um, what was your favorite scene in Reach? Favorite scene in Reach, um, probably I uh, like Carter's death. Carter's death, really? Yeah. Just because, uh, he went out like, he, I mean, you kind of can tell from after he started seeing the whole team start to go off that he was going to go out at one point, yeah. but you never really expected him to go out the way that he did. Mm -hmm. it, it was good for me. I, I kind of like that scene where they introduced Halsey for the first time, and um, and Halsey's like uh, just being totally, totally, totally stiff with them, and they're not telling her anything, and she's like, and, and she's like, Cat, you shouldn't have taken this. And, they're, and, and she's like, because you took a look at this, I was notified immediately. I could throw you in the brig for this. This is, class, this is highly classified as high as possible. You could be arrested for this. And Carter's like, maybe you'd like to join her. And she's like, are you? What? Are you? You know, how dare you? Like, I was like, how yeah. dare you? Are you questioning my authority even slightly? And he's like, interference with the Spartan operations on the ground is actually is practically treason, basically. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's not, you know, he's not wrong. When you have some kind of, yeah. something like that going on, somebody could be, you know, during wartime, you can't, you can't, that is technically, yeah. you know, that kind of thing, a major disobeying of orders like that is technically treason. I'm not saying Halsey committed treason, but she did skirt the line a little yeah. bit there. I mean, uh, Carter put her in a place at that moment. So, that's 2010 for you. That was a big release. So, when Halo came out, it came out, came out in a big way. Okay, so finally we're getting to 2011. 
Now, 2011, why aren't you talking about 2000? What came out in 2011? There were two major releases, there were two major events, major Halo events for 2011. Well, the first one was Bungie Day 77 2011. Right. Where Bungie released her Bungie vs. the World, it was her big bang of going out. They allowed people to have the Blue Flames, which was exclusive to Bungie members. They allowed them to have their name tags, which was exclusive to Bungie members, or people that work for Bungie and right. stuff. They, they basically said, you know what, we're going out, you you got us through this far, You have, we're the same as you, you have everything that we have now. Right, and they released the, the, the Blue Flame app, uh, they, they released the Bungie app on, on, the, yeah. on the iPhone, and you can unlock the Blue Flame with it, yeah. and I did a promotion at that time where I was giving out the Blue Flame until I ran out of Blue Flame, I'm sorry, not Blue Flame, it's the star name. Star. I activated the blue nameplate for myself. And, um, and then there was a star nameplay, which I did a promotion yeah. for, uh, which they did around 7-7, um, yeah. a little bit after. That, that thing on 7-7, though, every single member of Bungie yeah. was online playing Reach with multiple people. I'm sure that people watching this video, you can tell that you probably were in the match with a Bungie member. Mm -hmm. They were all out there playing. It was, it was a happy day for them, even though it was their last time that they were yeah. blessed. Yeah, because they were giving up, Yeah, they were, they were moving the servers. This was like yeah. the time of the big within, migration. I think within seven days or within a Months time, August seventh, that server finally moved over to three for the re industries. Right, and, uh, and that was like their big sign. I mean, it was one hell of a party at the very yeah. end. It really was. And then they released all those fantastic documentaries yeah. on their YouTube channel, which was kind of about the end of. of and I released all those on my. Well, I, I linked them on my website a long time ago. Uh, but that was that was a great way to end it. Yeah. I mean, and then we're all like, it's over. You know, this was like a huge part of my life. Yeah. This was like you know when Bungie had Halo. That was like, that was that was ten years of my. That was yeah. eleven years of my it's life. It's right say, oh, man, it's like. You know that there's going to be another company taking over Halo. Today. Right. Well, what's going to be released later on in the year? But mm -hmm. like, well, it's Bungie. I mean, it, Halo's basically over for us. Mm -hmm. So, what came after that? Well, we saw 343's first volley in Halo, which was them remaking Halo. The yeah, first Halo games. Right. So, what, what do you think about that game? It was definitely a great game. I mean, it reminded me so much of being playing uh, Halo. I mean, Halo was one of the first games I played. I remember going to my cousin's house who had the Xbox and you know, all my cousin would play Halo. Didn't I get you a copy of Halo as a gift? I think I did. You might have. That, that, was, a, that was only a couple years ago. That was later, yeah. Yeah. But it was definitely a great game because I mean, remember that when I was younger, my first video game experiences. And with the, uh, what's it, the option to go back into older graphics, it brought you back to playing Halo back in 2001 when it first came out. And you know, they finally responded to my request that I made a couple years ago on the site where I practically begged a lot of these developers to support some form of widescreen solution for some of these games because some of the older games you know, just didn't look very good on high definition television. Well, they did give us a solution. They basically were like, we'll re-release the games for the new consoles and you'll have widescreen there. So you have to rebuy the games, but we'll have, it, it is, that was technically a widescreen yeah. solution. They just re-released the games and I'd rebuy them. Could have been nice if they patched it, but you know what, beggars can't be choosers. So, I thought that was really nice. I loved the fact that we finally had local cooperative for that yeah. game. The game played the same. I wish the performance was really was better, mm -hmm. especially in the cutscenes. The performance wasn't very good. There was a little bit. Of, it wasn't a fluid. It wasn't as fluid as the Xbox version. But it was nice because they brought back all the original maps from Halo One into incorporated into Halo Reach. Right. So you could basically just either you know it included a code. You can either play Halo Reach on the, with a multiplayer with the Halo Anniversary disc or you could just you know redeem the code that was included and put them on Halo and download them to Halo Reach, yeah. which were, both worked. You could play on the same yeah. playlist and stuff like that amongst Reach players and keep all your status with like um, uh, what do you call it? Keep all your status with your with your armor yeah. permutations and armor unlocks and stuff like that. And the other cool thing was that year they updated the Halo Waypoint to um, support the um, the terminals, yeah. support the terminals for Halo Reach. I'm sorry for Halo Anniversary. And um, that got me through the majors, yeah. and, and and the warrant officer, you know, that got me through warrant officer and the majors, and all me, uh, got me all the way up to lieutenant commander. Because of that, I never would have been able to get to lieutenant commander um, if it wasn't for um, the, all that extra money I spent on um, all that extra money I yeah. got from uh, from that. So it was, it was definitely great with uh, having the terminals in there because it gave you some backstory to uh, three for three guilty spurs and his time on the Halo ring. Mm -hmm. I liked it a lot. I thought it was a great animation. Very good else too. So yeah, I really liked Halo Anniversary. Okay, so now we're going to be talking about what we think is our favorite year. You want to go first or should I? No, oh, you can go first. Well, I think the best year was probably 2009. I think that was probably my favorite year. Now, I'm going to say why. 
I would say that that was probably the biggest year of Halo releases. I mean, I understand that there wasn't a numbered Halo game that came out one of those years. And I know that there were some other contenders. You could easily say that 2007 or 2004 were probably big releases. Hey, you could even say 2001 was a big release. You could say any of the numbered Halo release years were big releases. But they were just one game that came out. Yeah. When it came to 2009, there were three, practically, you know, there were practically three major releases that came out that year. All games, which kind of showed to me that this was the first time Halo was branching out beyond the number of games. Now, I know that there had been the books, and I know that there had been the soundtracks released up to that point, but there had never been any other games released. There had never been any other, you know, in any other mediums other than, like, the books or the soundtracks or something like that, or even the comic books. This was it. This was their big, this was, like, the big year where, like, we can do we can do Halo games without Bungie. We can do Halo games that are not about the Master Chief. We can do more games that play in the Halo universe, and we can expand the Xbox to take advantage of all of the, uh, of the Halo universe. When they had the, the Halo Waypoint release, yeah. they, they they fed upon you know Halo ODST's release by including yeah. the Avatar unlocks, and the you know it made us go back to some of the earlier Halo games to unlock achievements because they were ranking up because that was really big at the time. They since kind of they still have that. But it's not really as prominent as it was back then. I mean, especially since when you get past like, either level 50 or level 55 or something like that, you've unlocked the last possible thing you can unlock yeah. in the game. And um, you can't unlock the beta shirt anymore, although I did. I remember when the beta yeah. came out. But that was, that was big. You know, that was a big thing. And um, that's why I think it was 2009 was probably the biggest thing. I thought Halo 3, ODST was fantastic. I liked Halo Wars a lot. Yeah. Um, and I've been forever grateful about the Halo Waypoint. You know, and now Halo Waypoint is being expanded even further because it's going to be the major delivery cycle for when it starts coming out yeah. on October 5th, the Halo, forward, uh, Halo 4 Forward Until Dawn series. That's going to be their big thing. That's going to be them on the forefront. Obviously, Machinima Prime is also releasing and stuff like that. But for the, Halo, for, for, for the Xbox 360 delivery of this series... It's going to be the Halo Waypoint. The Halo Waypoint's going to do it. So for me, I think that all of that was all fed starting in 2009. I think that was a big major turning point year for Halo. And that's why I think that's my, that my favorite year. For my year, I picked 2011. I know it wasn't a huge year it with only a remake of the game and Bungie leaving it, which made a lot of people sad. But I thought it was definitely a new start for Halo. I mean, if Bungie didn't want to do Halo games anymore, why force them to keep doing games? Let someone else that wants to do it take it over. And I believe that 3 for 3 will do a good job. But um, it was great because, I mean, you had Anniversary come out, which gave the new, next generation of gamers come in to realize what Halo really is. Get started off from the beginning again. See how, what started all this that we have right now. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was great to introduce that to a lot of new people. Not to mention that, um, aside from the games itself, Rooster Teeth started doing uh, Red vs. Blue Season 10, which started bringing out more of their animation things. They actually start doing actual animations and stuff within their videos. Mm -hmm. So I thought it was a good year for Halo. I have one question now from Maniac before we end this thing up. Alright, what is it? Do you think that 2012 can make it to one of the best years of Halo? I do. I do think that this could be a major year of, of, of Halo. And I think the reason why is because a lot of people are looking forward to Halo 4. I think Halo 4 is going to be great. It's looking to be great. But we're not going to know until the game comes out. But am I anticipating it? Yeah, absolutely. I'm really looking forward to it. I think this could be the biggest year of Halo leading up. We'll have to do another video about this to see. And we'll see you guys on November 6th for yes. the release of Halo. See you guys on November 6th. Until next time, guys, this is Maniac with GameAccess.net. This creator. Over and out. <laughs> you ever wonder why we're here? No. I never wonder why we're here. Simplify.